What is tradition? What is the difference between tradition and modernity? Is this even a useful dichotomy? We are going to discuss these questions and others recalling two permanent intellectuals, Abdullah Lari, who advocates modernity and calls to break with the past, and Talal Asad, who criticizes modernity. This is Mohanad from the University of Toronto. The discussion on tradition started roughly in the Age of Enlightenment, and the idea of progress was at the heart of this discussion. Many European intellectuals regard the Dark Ages to medieval thought and social practice. Change has become a central idea for progress, and innovation has been attached to improvement. Change must not be rejected. Instead, it should be accepted. The progress of a humankind has primarily meant the progress of empirical sciences and rationality of judgment. Both were seen as the proper sources that should regulate individuals and societies. The celebration of science and reason was at the expense of tradition. Whenever science and reason are praised, tradition is criticized. Scientific knowledge was claimed to be antithetical to traditional knowledge. Ignorance and traditionality were connected. Both seemed to be ingredients of the abhorred Ancien Régime, the famous French expression describing the old rule. So traditionality became the enemy of every critic of the Ancien Régime. Thus, rationality and scientific knowledge on the one side and traditionality and ignorance on the other side were set against each other as antitheses. A similar association was set between superstition and traditionality, despite a lack of a necessary connection between them. The tradition as a normative model of actions and beliefs was regarded as useless and burdensome. Those who were identified with traditional practices, beliefs, and ideologies were called reactionaries or conservatives. It was common among Enlightenment thinkers to perceive tradition as irrational, static, and homogeneous. In contrast, modernity, which includes rationality and progress, was perceived to be the remedy of the L of traditionality. This view of tradition that was inherited from the Age of Enlightenment influenced social sciences. For example, Max Weber demonstrated a similar view of modern tradition economy. He categorized societies into two types. One is traditional and one is modern. In his account of modern society, he didn't allow a much of a space for tradition. It was implicit in his interpretation that because tradition carries irrational fears, it would be demolished by the inevitable advance of rationalization. So what does our first intellectual, Abdullah Lawi, think about tradition? Lawi is a Moroccan historian, philosopher, and novelist. He is one of the most prominent Arab intellectuals. He authored multiple works, such as Modern Arab Ideologies and The Crisis of the Arab Intellectuals. His most important books are called Concepts of series, in which he discusses the major modern concepts, which are the concepts of freedom, reason, history, ideology, and state. In his project, Larry aims to transform the herb world from traditionality to modernity. He is concerned mainly about the backwardness of the Arab world compared to the progress in the West. As a solution for Larry, the Arab world has to change and transform from its traditionality to modernity. To do so, the Arab intellectuals have to adopt historicism. Historicism for Larry is the idea that gives a significance to space and time, such as historical period, geographical place, and local culture. 
Laroi's historicism is based on four principles. The first principle suggests that the laws of historical progress are constant. The second principle suggests that history is unilinear, in which it evolves from the past to the future and from backwardness to forwardness. The third principle suggests that many aspects of cultures are transferable. This transferability entails the unity of the humanity and the rejection of all essential differences. The fourth principle emphasizes the role of the intellectuals and politicians in advancing the progress of a humanity. According to Lowry, historical laws are inevitable. History is like a train that moves inevitably. So for societies to achieve modernity and progress, they have to accept and realize these historical laws. The only way for Laroi to achieve and accept these historical laws is historicism and therefore to achieve modernity. Hence, we should have a historical consciousness that allow us to understand the evolution of history and apply its historical conditions that allow us to achieve modernity. Laroi claims that the historical conditions of modernity were manifested in the West. These conditions can move anyone who uses them from their backwardness. So Arabs should follow the same historical conditions that the West followed and allowed them to achieve progress. For Laroi, achieving progress requires breaking with the past. This is to say that the Arabs tradition cannot produce modernity and therefore Arabs should break with their tradition. For Laroi, breaking with the past entails adopting the central conceptions of modernity. In his concepts of series, Laroi argues that in order to achieve modernity, Arabs should adopt and accept the five central conceptions of modernity, which are the conceptions of freedom, reason, ideology, history, and state, instead of the traditional ones. These five conceptions produce the complete form of modernity as seen in the West, and they also can produce modernity in the Arab world. In short, for Laroi, modernity is the aftermath of following the historical conditions. So if this is modernity, what is tradition for Laroi? In fact, Laroi agrees with many aspects of the Western modern conception of tradition. He believes in the modern tradition dichotomy. Tradition for him is a set of ideas, beliefs, and values that contradict with modern ones. Laurie talks about the French word tradition, which means tradition in English. And he says that this word has two meanings in Arabic. The first one it is what he calls turath. The second one is what he calls sunnah. And Torah for him is a set of customs, expressions, ethics that are inherited from previous generations. This kind of tradition refers to groups, not individuals. However, the second meaning of tradition, which is Sunnah, does not mean exactly the Islamic school of Sunnah. What Laroi means by that is the intellectual orientation that are chosen and adopted by a specific institution. So there is a Sunnah of Sunni, there is a Sunnah of Shi'i, there is a Sunnah of Catholicism, and so on and so forth. In most of his critique, Laroi means this second meaning of tradition, which is Sunnah. For Laroi, the tradition is not static as the Enlightenment view presents it. However, the tradition is an invented epistemology of the past, and it also imagines the past as static and authoritative. The interpretation and imagination of the past does not equal the past. It's always influenced by the time and place in which the reinterpretation and reimagination takes place. This image of the past is reconstructed and reinterpreted according to the current historical conditions. Thus, the process of 
traditionalization includes re-traditionalization. For Lowry, traditions are intrinsically limited by three factors. The first factor is temporal. This is to say that the reinterpretation is the past does happen in the current moment and according to the historical conditions. Even though the tradition refers to the past, it cannot escape the present. The second factor that limits the tradition is social. Traditions are chosen to be the tradition by the dominant class. In each society, there are people who have power to choose what is the tradition. People from different classes like military, political, religious people have the power to choose what is the tradition. The third factor that limits tradition has to do with confrontations. The traditional consciousness is usually invented while confronting other traditions and civilizations. For example, Larry suggests that the herb, in the herb tradition in the modern era is invented while confronting with the European and Western civilization. The conversation between herb intellectuals and other Western orientalists and colonialist intellectuals directed the focus of the herb intellectuals in the modern era. It's worth noting that in his invalidating of tradition, Lowry does not hold any negative point of view toward tradition. If I would explain what does Lowry mean by tradition, I would say that it's any intellectual orientation that detached itself from reality and does not have historical consciousness. Even adopting ideologies like Marxism and liberalism does not make one modern. For Lowry, historicism is the only way that make one modern by ignoring the absolute truth and make them focus on the evolution of history and reality. So let's move now to our second intellectuals, Talal Asad. Asad is one of the most important and influential modern anthropologists. His works include genealogy of religion, formations of the secular, and on suicide bombing. Asad provides a strong theoretical contribution to anthropology of religion and anthropology of secularism, a subfield that he actually invented. His critique of secularism and modern liberal state is very significant, especially in North American academia. In his influential article, The Idea of an Anthropology of Islam, Asad raises the question of the object of study. So when we say we are studying Islam anthropologically, what are we studying exactly? At the heart of this question, is the definition of Islam. Before presenting his definition of Islam, Asad presents the other approaches that study Islam and argue and theorize Islam. So the first one is the approach that rejects Islam as an anthropological and analytical category. An example of this approach is Abdul Hamid Zain, who claims that there are many forms of Islam and there is no one form that is more real than the rest. This approach leads Abdul Hamid Zain to argue that Islam should not be a category of anthropological study. So there is no such thing as an anthropology of Islam. The second approach claims that Islam is a mere label for different items that have nothing to do with each other's. According to this approach, it's just because the informants or the interlocutors call these heterogeneous items Islam, so they are Islam. Michael Gilson and who represents this approach claim that there is no form of Islam that should be excluded because it does not represent the true Islam. For him, Islam is just what Muslims everywhere do or say it is Islam. So Islam for Gilsonan is just 
what Muslims everywhere say it is or this is Islam. So this is why for Gilsonan as well as for Zayn, Islam should not be an object of analytical study for anthropologists. In contrast to the previous two approaches, the third approach claims that Islam is a distinctive totality that organizes all aspects of Muslim communities. Clifford Geertz and Ernest Gilner represent this approach. They consider Islam as an important analytical category by which we can understand the specificity of Muslim societies. Geertz talks about the particularity of the Islamic religious experience and Gilner talks about the specificity of the Muslim or Islamic social structures. Both of them actually uses the Orientalist essentialist conception of Islam. So both of them perceives Islam as a single entity that has an essence that doesn't change and eternal. Assad argues that all these three approaches are ineffective in solving the problem of the diverse forms of Islam. So he made a significant contribution that has the potential to revolutionize the ways that the Muslim societies are studied. He posits that when we study Islam, we should study it as a discursive tradition that includes and relates itself to the founding texts of the Quran and the Hadith. Assad argues that Islam is neither a distinctive social structure nor a heterogeneous collection of items, of beliefs, artifacts, and customs. He based his conception of Islam, of discursive tradition, from Michel Foucault's conception of discourse and discursive formation, and from Alasdair McIntyre's conception of tradition. Here I focus on Assad's conception of tradition. As he argues, answers to the question of what is Islam is shaped by the what he calls the narrative relation to the tradition. This includes whether one supports, opposes, or regards it as morally neutral. For Assad, a tradition consists essentially of discourses that seek to instruct the practitioners regarding the correct form and purpose of a given practice that precisely because it's established has a history. These discourses relate conceptually to a past when the practice was instituted and from which the knowledge of its point and proper performance has been transmitted. And the future, how the point of that practice can best be secured in the short or long term or why it should be modified or abandoned through a present how it's linked to other practices, institutions, and social conditions. An Islamic discursive tradition is simply a tradition of Muslim discourse that addresses itself to conceptions of the Islamic past and future, with reference to the particular Islamic practice in the present. Following this definition, Assad does not believe that everything Muslim do or say refer to the Islamic discursive tradition. He disagrees with the approach that considers all opinions are Islamic just because they are expressed by Muslims. He also disagrees with the Enlightenment classical point of view that tradition is simply imitates what was done in the past. This is also to say that the Islamic discursive tradition is a historically evolving set of discourses embedded in the practice and institutions of Islamic societies, and hence deeply imbricated in the material life of those inhabiting them. Assad rejects the essential difference between traditional and modern Islam. He criticizes writings that considers the Islamic movements in Egypt and Iran as partially modern. Those writings argue that the mix between modern and tradition cause a pathological character in the Islamic movements. On the contrary, Assad argues that describing these movements as partially modern presents these movements as inauthentically traditional. Also, he argues that this view pre-assumes that the real tradition 
is repetitive, irrational, and unchanging. Asad considers Islam as a useful analytical category, as long as we don't essentialize it. He also rejects the idea that traditions are invented, as Lowry and also other some Western intellectuals, such as Eric Hobsbawm, have argued. Tradition for Asad, as well as for McIntyre, is not a set of ideas, beliefs, customs that are antithesis of change, modernity, rationality. Using McIntyre's conception, each tradition has its own rationality. This view goes against Orientalists, who usually marginalize the place of arguments and reasoning in the tradition. According to Orientalists, Whenever arguments show up in a tradition, that indicates what they call the tradition in crisis. They think that tradition excludes arguments because it requires an unthinking conformity. However, for Asad, arguments and reasoning are necessary involved in the traditional practice. For example, arguments appear in the traditional whenever people have to be taught about the purpose and the proper performance of the practice. Arguments in the traditional practice also appear when the teachings are met with doubts, indifference, or lack of understanding. Thus, according to Asad, arguments indicate a live tradition. This view of rationality in tradition contrasts Laroi's view in which the perfect reason is the one that manifested in the modern West. Central to Asad's conceptualizing of the Islamic discursive tradition is orthodoxy. Orthodoxy for Asad refers to the notion of the correct model in which an instituted practice ought to confirm. The correct model is conveyed in authoritative sources such as the Quran and the Hadith in the Islamic tradition. Given the fact that the Islamic tradition is not homogeneous, that does not entail that all different interpretations and practices are equal. In contrary to Azain's approach, Asad does not argue for a completely relativistic understanding of the Islamic discursive tradition. In the next section, I will be discussing how these two different approaches of Asad and Laroui are reflected in their understanding of Muhammad Abdu, the famous Egyptian reformer. Muhammad Abdu is an influential Islamic scholar and reformer who lived in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He spent years in exile where he traveled to some European and Arab cities. Abdu's main concern was reform. He wanted to reform Islamic knowledge and challenge Western secularism. Abdu's discourse actually generated controversies. The significance in Abdu's discourse is that he wanted to reconcile Western rationality and scientific knowledge with the Islamic tradition that are inherited from previous generations. Laroui discusses Abdu in his book The Concept of Reason. For Laroui, the effort that Abdu made to reconcile the Islamic theological tradition with Western modernity generated what he calls Muhammad Abdu's paradox. For Laroui, the paradox starts from the contradiction that Arabs experience on a daily basis. Arab Muslims perceive their Islamic tradition as rational, while at the same time they acknowledge the irrationality in their countries. Abdu tries to resolve this contradiction by contending that the absence of Islam and the absence of the true Islam is the reason for this irrationality. For Laroui, Abdu's suggestion lead to a paradox. This paradox lies in the gap between the concept of reason in Islamic theology and that in Western modernity. Indeed, for Laroui, the appeal to a true Islam is irrelevant. Given the fact that for Laroui all traditions are invented, so for him what is considered to be the true Islam now would be different in another context. 
Abdu wanted to mobilize their tradition by returning to the roots of the Islamic faith, which are the Quran and the Sunnah. But Abdu's move, as Larawi understands it, is defensive in the sense that it aimed to defend the Islamic faith against the Western claims of the Islamic irrationality and tyranny. Abdu mobilized tradition to provide authentic definitions of reason and freedom that match the liberal understandings of these terms, in which freedom is the absence of tyranny and reason is the opposite of superstition and myth. For Lowry, the perfect concept of reason that is found in Western modernity cannot be found in the Islamic theology. Therefore, for Lowry, the effort that Abdu made to criticize the historical theology, Ilm al-Kalam, is not enough. So, Lowry claims that Abdu just rejected the theological outcomes without getting rid of the theological mentality. This is why Lowry argues that Abdu is just a new kind of theologian. The theological mentality that Lowry discusses draws on the absolute reason, a reason that refers to absolute truth. Lowry discusses this in his discussion of the reason and the reasonable. For him, the reasonable should result from reason. However, in theological mentality, the reasonable precedes and limits the reason. In other words, the reasonable is what might be called tradition, faith, and so on. The reasonable hegemonizes and limits the reason and does not result from it. Larry hence calls for an epistemological break with the past and adoption of the complete and perfect concept of reason as manifested in the West. So for Larry, any attempt to reconcile the theological conception of reason and the modern one would end up in a paradox, as happened with Muhammad Abdu. However, Assad understands Abdu from a different point of view. He discusses Abdu in the context of reforming the law in Egypt. In his book, Formations of the Secular, Asad discusses the different academic interpretations of Abdu's call for ishtihad. Scholars like Reinhard Chulsa, Charles Adam, and Aaron Laish understand Abdu's call for ishtihad as an attempt to break with the tradition. They understand Abdu's disagreement with other Islamic scholars as a dispute between reformers and conservatives. So, for example, Arun Laish argues that Abdu succeeded in displacing the authoritative exponent of the Sharia, who represent the tradition. Assad's critique of their interpretations is based on his conception of tradition. So, for Assad, their analyses are based on a priori conception of tradition and orthodox Islam as static and unchanging. So, for Assad, there is no such thing as the real ijtihad to be authenticated by the orientalist method. Rather, ijtihad is practiced by some people who follow different methods within the tradition. This is to say that Abdu did not invent a new method of ijtihad but he invoked a tradition of several centuries old, especially with his use of Ibn Taymiyyah's call for ishtihad. So, for Asad, Abdu was not departing from the legitimate usage of tradition. According to Asad, by using ishtihad, Abdu was not breaking with the past. Instead, he was setting up a framework of an Islamic modernity, while at the same time still committing to the Islamic discursive tradition. Asad emphasizes that Abdu remained within the tradition even though his project intersected with some European Western ideas. In short, despite the views that present Abdu's project as a break with the past, Asad views Abdu's ijtihad as part of this tradition. So this was our topic today. We discuss how Larawi and Asad discusses the traditions and how their conceptions of tradition is reflected in their understanding of Muhammad Abdu. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching.